Hey guys, welcome to the bathroom remodeling series. In this video, number five, we're talking about bathroom insulation and ventilation concerns and issues. I get a lot of questions from clients that come up uh, during a bathroom remodel. But one question that never comes up or seems to make that discussion is bathroom insulation and ventilation and the stuff that goes in behind that. Sure. People definitely want a bathroom shower fan and they certainly want their walls insulated, but do they really know what a contractor is installing or what they're scoping out or what kind of components they're doing for this type of work? People spend tens and tens of thousands of dollars on bathroom remodels and have no idea what type of insulation goes in or what type of fan or if it's even installed properly. Talk about insulation. No matter where you put it, it always seems to be a good investment. Installing insulation that offers excellent moisture control properties will minimize the possibility of vapor collecting under that insulation in that wall cavity. For years, we accomplished this by using a 6 mil vapor retarder over fiberglass insulation, and it works. It works okay. Vapor barriers, I get a lot of questions about them, and especially with in moist rooms, you know, rooms with showers. While bathroom moisture vapor in the air can be transferred through walls and ceilings, the real issue is when that moisture vapor becomes trapped in the walls, resulting in mold and mildew growth. So we don't want it in that wall cavity. Mold is unhealthy and it can damage your home and certainly prevent structure and health issues as well. So how do we enjoy that hot steamy shower and avoid mold problems? Well, the answer is a combination of using proper insulation, a vapor barrier, combined with excellent ventilation. So let's talk about vapor barriers quickly before we get into vape, uh, ventilation. The, the level of vapor control required for the interior surface of your wall, whether it's fiberglass, rock wool, or cellulose insulation, is determined by your local building codes. And that's based off of the Department of Energy's climate zones for construction based on your region of the United States where you live. Lately, I've been using a lot of spray foam and, and, and just eliminates the need for a lot of the, the vapor barrier issues that I'm concerned about because it accomplishes a lot of the goals we're about to talk about right now. Why spray foam? Spray foam is a polyurethane foam that's heat activated polymer and it's sprayed into place. It foams up or expands and, and basically hardens in place. Uh, the best part of, of spray foam is that it, it fills all of the gaps and crevices in the area you're spraying that fiberglass, cellulose, rock wool cannot reach. Thus, it seals off air leaks in the process. So there are two types of spray foam that I briefly want to touch about. There's open and closed cell spray foam. People get these confused. Open cell spray foam is lighter and less dense option than closed. It is cheaper than it's the cheapest of the two and it has less insulating power, so a lower R value than closed cell. Open cell is also not a good option in wet or moist areas because it can act like a sponge and absorb moisture or retain it. I like spray foam, uh, closed spray foam. Closed spray foam is denser, it's certainly more expensive, it's the most expensive. It also provides rigid support to certain structures because it ties everything together when it dries. Closed cell is less permeable and can be used as a water vapor barrier, thus I use it in all my bathrooms now when I can. Air leakage, we talked about that um, sealing air leaks with spray foam. Air leaks are areas of warm air leaking into your home in the summer and out of your home in the winter when you're heating and they typically occur in the same spots on most houses. Pipe and, and wire penetrations around chimneys, there's a whole list on, in the article um, on Concord Carpenter that we cover that if you want to try to chase those down. Spray foam fills those cavities and blocks small holes and it creates, uh, basically creates, seals those air leaks in the building's envelope. And as a result, it's an effective vapor barrier and air leak sealer. Talk a little bit about ventilation because they go hand in hand with insulation. The most important factor in a bathroom shower is the exhaust fan. A properly installed fan will control moisture, remove the moisture from the area, from the area and it's going to decrease that humidity that builds up. Warm, moisture-laden air moves towards colder wall surfaces where it condense into, into, condenses into water and causes problems. Moist air can also work into the wall cavity that we, we discussed earlier and condense in the wall cavity. Both situations are going to result in mold, odors, and maybe possibly health or structural damage. The only effective way 
to prevent mold is to keep the indoor moisture levels low. A properly vented to the exterior shower fan can avoid that problem. So let's talk about choosing a bath fan. Choose a quiet, energy efficient fan. And you want to obviously choose one that will accomplish what you need. And that means sizing it to your room and thinking about your duck run and factoring that in. There are tons of quality brands out there. Newtone, Panasonic, Ventec, and Brone are just a few. Most fans have Home Ventilating Institute, HVI ratings that compare noise and energy efficiency. So when looking at fans, consider how much noise they make. Bathroom fans are measured in zones. The noise, the noise is zones. And many bathroom fans come in four to six zones. That's too loud. Instead, try to get one that's around 1.5, which is, in my opinion, rated as a quiet fan. 1.5 zones. Also, look for a fan that has a ball bearing motor for quality and longevity purposes. Before you buy a fan, you'll need to determine your room's cubic feet per minute, CFM. And you'll need to do that to figure out if the fan that you want to purchase can handle the size of your room and also the length and run of your duct run. So to match your CFMs to your room, your fan to the room, determine your CFMs by looking at or multiplying your length of your room times your height times 0.13. You'll also need to think about air exchanges per hour. The air exchange per hour means the airflow rate sufficient to remove the air volume in any given room a specific number of times. Your bathroom exhaust fan should be properly sized to remove, uh, to have an air exchange rate of 11 to 15 changes per hour. Uh, fan location. Locate your fans, your bathroom fan, to ensure maximum moist air extraction. Steam rises, so in a shower, that's the ceiling or near the ceiling or just outside the shower. Um, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about determining fan duct length and how long should long be. Well, bathroom fan ducting can neg negatively affect fan performance if it's uninsulated in, in some areas, undersized, droopy like flex duct, which is crap, is excessively long, has too many elbows, all of those things can restrict the fan's rated airflow. So in order to keep your fan effective, try to lay out your, your duct work according to the installation manual, but also minimizing turns. One thing people didn't, don't realize is that 190 degree elbow is like adding 10 to 15 feet of airflow resistance to the ducts. The best, uh, it's also best to uh, um, Use solid smooth pipe, like the aluminum pipe that you put together. Solid pipe has less airflow resistance and flows better than rigid pipe or uh, corrugated type stuff. Uh, make sure you seal the joints, put your seams facing upward when you're installing it. Uh, and if you're going through an unheated space, you want to make sure that you insulate that pipe so it doesn't condense water or moisture in the pipe. All these fans come with instructions and instruct you on how far your ductwork can be. Be sure to follow those because some fans are only rated for so many feet and if you have a bunch of elbows and different turns, it's going to uh, cause problems with the CFMs for the fan. You may need a more powerful fan for that area. Also, let's talk a little bit about timer switches. You want to run your fan while you're showering, but it's also recommended to run it at least 20 minutes after you shower. And, and that's to get all the air, the moist air out of that room and do that air exchange. That's best done with a timer. Get a timer, turn it on while you're showering, and then let it run while you're in the shower. Most, uh, you also need to make sure that your, your bathroom fan vents to the exterior, whether it's through an exterior wall, through a roof, or through a faucet. I mean, a faucet, a soffit. I prefer a wall with a, with a, a damper, backdrop damper. Um, look, understanding these ventilation and insulation needs and making sure that they're scoped out in your next project is super important. Make sure you read the article because we go in much, much deeper depth. This was just a summary of the article. I'm Rob Robillard. Subscribe to this video channel, please, and check out our next bathroom remodeling series. It's going to be video number six. It's going to be talking about uh, installing a Weedy brand waterproofing shower system. Take care.